food, to feed a growing body, to nourish a curious mind, to satisfy a sweet craving, to create a new connection, to bring families and people together. At General Mills, we serve the world by making food people love. But that's not the only way we serve. We serve by harnessing the power of food for good. We believe that all children should be nourished and ready to learn at school. We believe that perfectly good food should go to feed hungry people, not landfills. We believe in sustainable agriculture for healthy soil and planet. We believe in protecting and increasing bee population. We believe in nurturing the smallholder farmers who grow our ingredients. We believe in caring for the communities where our employees live and work. That's the power of food. This is the power of General Mills. Great. Uh, so, Jeff, do you want to make some opening remarks before we get started on our conversation? You would like to say something about what Mills is up to? Or? Yeah, let me say a couple of words, and then, uh, then I'd like to spend the majority of the time talking about questions and answers, things that are on your mind, and maybe some people from the audience. But first of all, it's, it's a thrill for me to be here, especially knowing that it's the 100th year anniversary of the Carlson School. And, and one of the things that's in, most interesting, I think, is I, I've, I've met a lot of people uh, today that, uh, that I've known for a long time from a lot of different parts of the community. And one of the things that I think that you all know is that, you know, how, how interesting it is the relationship between business and government, the community and the University of Minnesota. And, and it's so special, but I think it's easy to take it for granted. And I spend a lot of time with CEOs from around the country and around the world. And I can tell you, they, they don't have gatherings like this. And, um, you know, I, and the reason I just mentioned it, I know you know it, but it's, I think it's up for us to preserve it. And that doesn't mean that everyone has to agree with everything all the time, but I think we're all better when we work together. And, and that's how General Mills got its start. I mean, it started on the banks of the Mississippi River, or Cadwallader, or Washburn in 1866. And, and, you know, they had an accident at the flour mill in 1878. And, and not only did he, he, he make good on the flour mill, but, but also set up an orphanage for the children and the families who were, who were devastated by that. And I think from 1878 on, we've been practicing social, social responsibility and corporate social responsibility. And it's the kind of values that, that he shared mm -hmm. that I think have carried on, you know, into the third century here in the Twin Cities. And so, you know, from that beginning, General Mills is now a, a company of 40,000 employees around the world making food people love. We created the Nerf Ball many, many years ago. Um, helped create the black box for airline recorders and, and actually did some work on, to, on submarines. But, but now we just, we just serve the world by making food people love and I'm, I'm honored to be here. And I'm especially pleased my, that you mentioned my wife Lisa could join us, uh, a Carlson School, a very proud Carlson School grad, and uh, as well as some colleagues from General Mills and a lot of people who have made a difference in, in my career um, who are sitting out in front here. So thrilled to have them, uh, have them join us. Thank you, Jeff. And, um you know, food has been changing over the, you know, uh, the way people consume food, the kinds of food that are being talked about, et cetera. How is, uh, why is it one of the most dynamic industries today and how has it changed over the last few years and how has General Mills maintained its leadership position in that whole space? Well, I think, I think it, the, the food industry is kind of dynamic, uh, you know, and, and food, the food industry and dynamic really didn't go together for, for, a, number of, uh, for a number of years. But, but over the last decade, that's really changed, and it's changed along a, a lot of dimensions. One is just how food is marketed. And if you, if you think about General Mills has three of the top five uh, websites in the country for food preparation. So Betty, BettyCrocker.com and Pillsbury.com and Tablespoon.com. We certainly didn't have that. 25 years ago because, because nobody did. But we have tens of millions of households that, uh, that, that we serve through that website. So how we market food has changed. In fact, I mean, when I was coming up through the organization, we, we had put together a plan for a year and we'd run some TV and some coupons in the newspaper. And now millennials, they don't even, they don't even get newspapers and, and most of them don't know how to turn on the TV. They, they're, they're watching other kinds of screens. And so for us, we market in a completely different way. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. 
in addition to the websites we have, we, we just launched a new product, which is fantastic, Cinnamon Toast Crunch Churros. And it's just at the market, there's some people nodding in the front row. So I'm, and, they were, <laughs> and they were smiling as they were nodding, so that pleases me. But in, uh, we, we put out this information to, to a set of bloggers. And in the first three days, we had 250 million impressions. And so, you I mean, that kind of coverage wasn't something you could do as a marketer. So it's kind of a golden age of marketing. So how we market to people has, and the dialogue we have with consumers has changed. How people eat has changed. Um, I, I think the biggest, the biggest change over the last 25 years is the growth in snacking. It used to be that snacking represented a small minority of consumer eating occasions. Now it's actually the majority. And um, also the definition of health is changing. Some people say, well, we're eating healthier than ever. I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but, I can, but I can definitely tell you we're eating differently than ever, and not only snacking, but a lot of natural and organic. General Mills is the second largest natural and organic producer in the country with brands like Annie's and Cascadian Farm, Muir, Grant, Muir Glen, Lara Bar. And now we're the leading uh, purveyor of uh, natural dog food in the, in the U.S. with uh, Blue Buffalo. And some people said, you know, how can a, a food, you know, you're a food company, how do you get into the, the pet food business? Well, uh, for most of you who have pets, I mean, pets are just furry members of the family. And uh, as it turns out, a lot of the trends in pet food are the exact same trends in human food. And so the way people eat have changed. And I think as we look over the next five years, the thing that's going to change more than anything else is how food is delivered and, and the use of technology in doing that. And, and um, we have a strong e-commerce presence um, with, uh, with grocers around the, around the country and around the world. The leading market really for food and e-commerce is, is Korea. With, uh, with China not too far behind, and the U.S. actually lags. We, you know, we, we're used to being the first of things in food and, and, and e-commerce. We're actually one of the, of the developed markets. We're one of the slowest. So um, there's a lot changing. And, and for us, it's a, matter of, you know, it's a matter of making sure we keep up with that change. And whether it's buying natural and organic companies or changing the way we market or getting into the pet food business, we've done a lot over the last few years to, to catch up with that change. And I think... As we think about change, one of the keys is as you, and, and uh, Bruce Atwater, who is a former CEO of General Mills, was, was, was doing a talk in 1982. And you know, he said there's, a, there's always a tension between what you keep the same and what you change. And I think that's true of General Mills now more than ever. And for us, the thing that can't change is our values, which is one of the reasons I wanted to show that video, because in a world that is so dynamic, whether it's economically dynamic or politically dynamic or food values change or in technology changing, I feel like you have to have something that tethers you to the, tethers you to the ground. And for General Mills, that's always been our values. And it's one of the things I'm, I'm probably most proud of. And one recent a industry analyst said, uh, you know, what, gener you know what generates, what, what's different about General Mills and other companies, you know, is the cost structure. I said, you know, you, for, you know with all due respect, you have no idea. It's not that at all. It's, it's the values that we have and it's the culture that we put forth and it's the people that we have at the company. That's what sets General Mills apart. And um, this youngster just didn't have it quite, quite right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that speaks very much to, um, you know, how, how do you create and sustain that kind of corp corporate culture? How do you create a, a, a culture of, say, conscious inclusion in your company? How do you maintain that, uh, these values? And, you know, and to what extent is there, are these values somehow related to, uh, uh, you know, to, to us as a state? I mean, are you kind of, in some ways, I mean, has the, has the evolution of these values, is, are they Minnesota values in any way, or is it, uh, what do you feel about that? Well, there, I mean, there are a number of questions to unpack there. I mean, I guess I would, I guess I would start by saying, for me, the, the values of the company are, you know, are unchanging and, we, and are unwavering. And so we talk about doing the right thing all the time. It's not, it's not doing the right thing when it's convenient for you. Mm -hmm. It's doing the right thing all the time. And we talk about we talk about winning as a team. It's not you know winning it as a team if you can't, but if you can't, just go on it by yourself. I mean, it's winning as a team, and business is a team sport. And the, you know, I think the values. I think they are Minnesota values. Um, I think they're they're U.S. values. But I would tell you the values that General Mills has are the same across the world. And we've recently won awards in India and in China for our corporate values, and that probably makes me as proud as anything else. And so they are consistent around the world. In terms of how they evolve over time, it's interesting that I think the values of the company remain the same, but the key with uh, culture, I think, just like, just like brands themselves, they're, they're not static. I mean, Cheers is not the same as it was 50 years ago, even though it's still a leading brand. And the, the same would be true of cultures. And so you have to update cultures for the time. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of examples. And, 
you know, in, um, in 1966, General Mills brought his first uh, female board director on, and, and Bruce Atwater was the one who, who did that. And then, and then, you know, Steve Sanger came along, and he did a lot of things for diversity at General Mills. But one thing he's really known for is, and, and he's here today, so I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm conscious I'm talking to the guy who did it, but is really about, about bringing women along in the organization. And we had our first female vice president in 1972, and, and the diversity, the gender diversity really picked up over Steve's leadership, and he contributed that. And then, you know, Ken Powell did a lot of, with diversity too, especially the uh, LGBT network and championing gay marriage, very controversial at the time, but, but from an inclusion perspective and from our values perspective, exactly the right thing to do. And Ken did a lot of things, but he's known for that. You know, and, and I think about that because it's, it's, it's been, you know, it's, that's three decades and four decades in the making. These things don't happen overnight. And so I, I feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to carry on that tradition as the CEO of General Mills now. And for me, it's really more about inclusion. And, you know, if diversity is about who's sitting at the table, and we're a very diverse company now, then inclusion is about do they have a voice and can they bring their best game every day? And, and we're a more global company now. And if you have an inclusion, inclusive culture, I think that actually begets diversity because to the extent people can feel they can bring their best game, whether they're male or female or black or white or Chinese or French or American or Brazilian, do they feel like they can bring and their thoughts will be included and their opinions really matter? I think that's going to, be, that's going to be get even more diversity. And so even though that value has stayed the same as a company, over several generations of leaders, I think we've all kind of moved the ball forward. And that's, I think that's one of my responsibilities as the current CEO. So t tell us a little bit maybe about um, your leadership journey. You know, you've been with General Mills for now, as I mentioned, almost 25 years. And how has that journey and the different roles that you've helped shaped the leader that you are today? Well, it's been a journey. It's been, you know, it's been kind of a wandering path. People ask me about career paths as if it's kind of straight. At least for me, it's been, it's been kind of a wandering one. And I think it is for, for a lot of people coming up today. In terms of the, the leadership journey, I guess, there, there are two big influences. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to have some of my mentors here today because if you ask anybody from, anybody from General Mills, you know, why do they come and why do you stay? They're gonna, they're gonna, tell, you th these, they're gonna tell you three things, but they're gonna tell you in this order. The first is the people. I came because of the people. And then they're gonna mention something about values and if they're in marketing, they're gonna mention something about the brands. And the, um, but it always, it always starts with the people. And I think for me, my leadership journey begins with learning from those around me. And so um, Ian Friendly is here and Christy Strauss and Bob Waldron, people who, are, who are, uh, I worked for at, at General Mills. Bob was my first, my first boss. And, and I knew we were gonna get along well before, I, I hadn't started with a company yet. I showed up in July and, um, and he gave me a call and he said, uh, are we having a team meeting out on Lake Minnetonka and uh, well, you, you wanna come out for a beer? And, um, and I, was, I, was, I, I do like beer, and so I was happy to do that. <laughs> and it turns out that Bob does too. And, uh, but more importantly, you know, what, it, what it said was, you know, he cared about me and assimilating me into the team. And one of the, you know, a lot of research has shown the difference between good leaders and great leaders is do you care about your people? Everyone cares if you can get the job done. And holding people accountable is certainly important. But what distinguishes good from great is do you care about the people themselves? And, the, um, and certainly Bob showed that from the, from the very beginning. And, and uh, you know, whether it was Christy Strauss who talked, you know, really taught me about authenticity. I mean, you know, really an authentic leader. I learned a lot from her at CPW or, or Ian Friendly with creativity and, and the ability to use other people's talents. Mm -hmm. You know, Ian and, I, Ian and I probably have some different talents, but I, it, we always really work really well together and always very complimentary. And, and I always respected the fact that, that he could take the things that I did well and use those and the things he didn't, he, he'd make up for in some other way. And, and I would hope that I learned some of that stuff as a leader. So I, I learned a lot from the people, mm -hmm. but then there's also be a lot to be gained from experiences and from different experiences. And for me, probably the, the best leadership moment for me was my time I spent at Serial Partners Worldwide in Europe. I went there as a, as a vice president in 2003. I worked for Ken Powell and then, and then Ian and then and Christy. And um, I was 36 years old. I, I had never managed, and I was a vice president for this you know, $2 billion business. And, and I kind of knew what I was doing, but, but not fully. And, um, 
And it was an office, this, this joint venture, the Serial Partners joint venture, has people from Nestle and people from General Mills and people hired in for the joint venture. We had more than 30 nationalities represented in this office of 100 people. And uh, the very first time I got my team together, I gave a baseball analogy and it went absolutely nowhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, and then the next time I talked about soccer, or as they call it, football, and it was fabulous. But I, in, in, that, in that environment, I learned a lot about the value of inclusiveness and diversity. And because when you have people from three different countries and 30 different nationalities, you know, there's an American view of diversity, but then there's a broader view of diversity, which gets into style and country of origin and cultural norms. And, and what you learn is that you can really make magic happen if you can get people with a lot of different backgrounds kind of going in the same general direction. For me, that was a, that was a real turning point in, in, my, in my career and a, and a great leadership experience. Well, I can st uh, see why you are the leader that you are. I mean, you've given credit to just about everyone sitting in this room except for yourself. So that's, <laughs> that's quite amazing, really. Uh, you know, uh, it's um, it, 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 often leadership hap, you know, g gets honed when you have to make tough decisions. Mm. Have there been any particularly tough decisions that you had to sort of uh, deal with? And how have you, uh, <laughs> what was the pr process you, you uh, went through to, into making the decision? And how, did, and how did you figure out afterwards whether it was the right decision or not? Well, the, um, and, and, you know, when you have a dynamic environment like we have in the food business now, I mean, the, the definition of insanity would be to do the same thing over and over again and expect something different. And, mm -hmm. and so when you have a dynamic environment, you have to be dynamic yourself as an organization. And, you know, one of the things that was the toughest for us, and certainly for me personally, was that, you know, we have reduced the size of our workforce by more than 10% over the last five years. And... And we, had to, we really had to do it as a matter of survival as a company and to continue to adapt. And, and I was reflecting because there were many, many years ago, General Mills laid off a third of its workforce and, um, and then had the best two decades they've ever had as a company after that and because they were willing to change. And it was hard because General, General Mills is kind of like a family. I mean, it's been around for a long, long time. And, and I think that's one of the things that is the, the great, one of the greatest assets of General Mills. But when it comes to change, it's one of the hardest things. Try to change family dynamics. There's, there's very few things harder than, than that. And, and as we were downsizing our organization, um, I mean, these are people I'd worked with for a long, long time. And, and so you, you try to do those things with great care and respect. And I think we have. But, um, but it's hard to do. And for me, you know, how did I, you know, how do you get, how do you get through that? For me, we have 40,000 employees, but we let 10% go, but there's 90% still there. And they're 90% counting on, counting on me to do the right thing for the organization to make sure it's a viable concern going on. And so, you know, when I, whenever I had to deliver bad news to people who are really good employees, really talented people, you know, I, I would think of the 35,000, if, if I don't make those choices, they're not going to like the outcome very much. And then I reflect back on General Mills decades ago, the left, uh, you know, a third of its workforce go and then had, you know, uh, a lot of good years because they were willing to change. I mean, General Mills is not a company that's been around 150 years because it can't change. It's, a, it's been around 150 years because it's willing to change and uh, keeping the values the same, but willing to change. So that was, um, that was probably the toughest. And then, you know, uh, in my first year as CEO in the third quarter, we, uh, we missed our earnings target and we called it down for the quarter and we called it down for the year. And I gotten a lot of advice for people, former CEOs and others about, you know, like, what, what do I do the first year as CEO? And had all these great ideas. And they said, that's, that's fantastic. Why don't you just hit your numbers? I mean, why don't you? It'd be great if you could deliver shareholders what you, what you said. And, and, and we didn't. And the, not only that is that we were expecting a better result than we had. We had just bought Blue Buffalo, which is going to be a great business for General Mills. Very excited about that. And then we had, not only did we miss our third quarter results, but we had to take down our, our numbers for the year. And so that was really tough. And the, the, you, when you have an experience like that, you, you know, as I told our team, we're either going to get a lot better or we're going to get a lot worse. There's no staying the same. And it's really up for us now to decide which of those is going to be. And, you know, for the three quarters after that, we exceeded earnings targets um, from the street. And I'm very proud of that because, I mean, it showed the resiliency of the team and how seriously they, they took it. And we have earnings here in a couple of weeks, so I can't tell you if it's going to be four or not. But, I, but for the first three, it went really well. And, and we're, a lot, we're a better organization now than we were in the third quarter a year ago. We're not perfect, but we're a lot better. And uh, I'm really proud of the team for that. But that was, <laughs> that was a little rough because um, imagine, you know, imagine taking a class and getting a D, but have everybody in the world know it. 
<laughs> and then, and you know, people for the first time, you know, in a long time, they question your credibility as an organization. And, and so you have to fight through that. And, um, and we have. Mm -hmm. And um, have we done it the right way? I don't know. Time will be the final judge of that. But, um, but I feel pretty good about how, how we've handled it so far. So finally, how much has Minnesota mattered to General Mills? I mean, you, you began on the banks of the Mississippi, Mississippi River, as you mentioned, uh, more than 150 years ago. Uh, the state started not very, you know, uh, uh, is about as old. And, you know, it's your home to now 100 brands, you know, 4,000 employees in the Twin Cities. And how have uh, General Mills in the state of Minnesota, have, have you sort of, how have, they, how have they helped shape one another? Well, first of all, they, 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 I mean, they definitely have helped shape one another. The, you know, the values that Minnesota has, the values of humility. I mean, one of the, one of the greatest things about General Mills is it's, it's not a culture that, that really puts up with people who aren't, who aren't humble. I mean, it's, it's nice people and smart people, but as a culture, we're humble, and sometimes too much so. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we need to talk about all the things we're doing, and uh, it's one of the reasons I played the video. I, sometimes we, we are not, we're not out there enough, but the sense of community that we have sure. and tying in with and working well with others, playing nicely with others, I think it's one of our greatest corporate attributes. In fact, when I was, when I was talking to some directors about getting the CEO job, directors at General Mills uh, from the board, they said, what's your competitive advantage? One of them said, well, I asked, what's, your, what's your biggest competitive advantage? And I said, we're not jerks. And uh, he laughed and he said, is that, is that really one of them? I said, it is. And I said, because in the next 10 years, it's all going to be about partnership. You don't get anything done by yourself. And uh, who wants to work with a jerk? And, um, and we, all, we all know them. And we all know companies that have that reputation. But, you know, the, the reason we're able to partner so well with people like the University of Minnesota or the state government or Grow North or the Nature Conservancy uh, is because we believe in win-wins and we believe in winning as a team. It's the reason why we started a venture fund called 301 Inc. and we invest in minority firms. And the reason why we've done well with these firms is because people want to work with us because we, we truly try to help them and they help us back. And um, a lot of times it feels like companies and organizations try to figure out how to cut up the pie rather than trying to make it bigger. And you make the pie bigger, there's enough for everybody. And I think that's one of the things that sets General Mills apart. And, and that's, a, that's a value, I think, of living here in the Twin Cities. I would also say there's nothing that gets done in, 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 um, in General Mills that, doesn't have a, that doesn't, hasn't been touched by someone who's graduated from the University of Minnesota. And uh, it, is, it is fantastic to have a, an institution of this caliber in our backyard. I'm the son of two college professors, so I think I know of what I, of what I speak. Mm -hmm. And um, we have so many grads from the, the University of Minnesota. I did not know we were one of the first ones to give a gift, but I can tell you that the school, whether it's the Carlson School or many other schools at the University of Minnesota, have given back so much to, to General Mills. And I think it's a great relationship, and I think we give back something too. Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it works well for, for you all, and it works well for, for us. Great. Thank you so much. You know, our provost is here, Karen Hansen. I just wanted to mention that. I hadn't uh, seen you earlier, so it's great to have you here. And on that note for the, for the University of Minnesota, I think at this point we'll open it up to the audience. I'm sure many of you have questions, and I, I know there are folks out there with mics. And uh, so please put your hand up if you have a question to ask. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is. Um, you talk a lot about change. Maybe you can share with us some of the change management practices that you kind of put in place and lead to get the other 35,000 employees uh, on the same uh, sheet uh, as you try to drive the organization forward. So the question, I'll, I'll repeat it just in case somebody didn't hear it. The question is about change and change management practices and how do we get everybody on the same the same page. You know, one of the things I've learned about, I've learned a couple of things about change that are important. The one is when people say they want change, what they really mean is they want everybody else to change and they want, you, they want to keep doing what they're doing. And the fact that you're all laughing, you've seen this, you've seen this yourselves. <clears throat> the other thing I would say is with change is, I mean, the uh, perfection is the enemy of change. And whenever you're going to change, you know, you have to, you have to be gentle with yourselves because when you start to change, you're not going to get everything right. And, and the key is not to get everything right. The key is if something goes wrong, how fast are you able to identify it and how fast are you able to pivot? In a world that's dynamic, the ability to pivot is a lot more important than the ability to write together the first time. So I would say in, in terms of, so that would be the first thing I would say in terms of change is that getting everybody on the same page, you're, it, it takes a while. 
and everybody is on a different change curve, and you have to realize everyone's on a different change curve. The second, you know, I, I think, that, you know, what, but what things can aid in that? Um, the more you can push the change down through the organization, the, the better off. And so the, it starts at the top with clarity. And um, I pride myself on being clear. I'm not sure I always am, but I pride myself on it and, and trying to keep things relatively simple because as, it, as something goes through an organization, it's only going to get less clear and it's, it's only going to get more complex. So if you, start out, if you start out with clear and simple, by the time you get all the way through, you're probably going to have less clear and complex. So from a change management point, I would, I would say I would start with, with that. And then the key is the middle of the organization. It always is the middle of the organization because the people at the top of the organization, they see enough of what's coming to change. The people at the bottom, they just started. And so they don't, they don't have as much invested. It's always the middle. And the change occurs. If, it, if it's going to go well, it's going to be in the middle of the organization. If it doesn't go well, it's not going to be in the middle of the organization. And so one of the things that I do is a couple of times a week, I meet with directors in our company. I have lunch with all of our directors and vice presidents at least once a year in a group. And it, it's Q&A. And it's, for me, it's a way to connect with the people who, you know, who I think are the ones who really drive change. And to, hear, to get their feedback directly on what's going well and what's not going well. And that's all supported by a great HR department. Our head of HR is here, and they do. They kind of help lead us through that journey. But it's a team effort. And I, what I would say is if, if, if you're going to want a change journey, it's just not going to be perfect, and you have to, you have to start with that mindset. Any questions? Let's uh... okay. So the, the question really is, she said she liked what I had to say about, uh, about inclusion. Thank you take that, um, about inclusion and the, you know, div the difference between diversity and inclusion and, and how, do you, how do you develop a more inclusive culture. Yeah, for me, I mean, diversity is about who sits at the table and inclusion really is about do they have a say and you have to marry those two things. It's not as, it's not as discreet as that, but that's at least how I frame it up initially. And, and um, having an inclusive culture is uh, it's a lot of work. And I don't think you switch the light on from one day to inclusive and another day not. And especially, let's, let, I mean, I'm not going to get into a big political speech here, believe me, but, but I mean, our political environment doesn't exactly help with, with that. But I think that for me, that's why, that's why inclusiveness at General Mills is such a competitive advantage, because if, if, there's a lot of diver, if there's a lot of divergence in the outside world, but in General Mills is a place you can come and, and feel as if your views are respected, that helps a lot. One of the things that, that we certainly do is we do a lot of, we do a lot of internal training on, uh, on leadership behaviors and leadership expectations. And the way we've done, we've always been, I think, really thoughtful about how we develop our people. We're doing it in different ways now than we ever have before. We did a global campaign, called, we called Engaging Leaders, <clears throat> which we rolled out to, to uh, more than 5,000 employees in a month globally. And, uh, and so we've got a set of engaging leader behaviors. We also talk about the how you do things in addition to the what. It's not good enough to have good results. If you're a leader, the expectation is that you lead well in addition to getting the results. So the how is as important as the what. That's the thing I was, uh, that's I guess a second. And you know, another thing we've done, which I think has been really interesting and helpful is we've, we've fostered a, 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 um, a, a series called um, Courageous Conversations. And it really is about the conversation itself because too many times we get into these opposite corners, whether it's liberal or conservative and Democrat or Republican, or I believe this and you believe that. And people talk at each other, not to each other. And so we, we, have, we have, have this series called Courageous Conversations. I'll give you a couple of examples. One, we had uh, one gentleman who's African-American, and we had somebody from the police force, who, by the way, happened to be a son of another employee. And we had a cour courageous conversation about, about race and, and law and how that works in this country. And the, the, the objective is just to have a conversation. There's no pre-intended outcome, only to hear the other side. And, you know, we had one on being LGBT in the workforce. We had one on mental health in the workforce. And, and so what we try to do is create a forum for conversation where there doesn't have to be a, an ending. And, and one of the things we found, I think, in, I think it, it helps with a more inclusive environment because then everyone's opinions are, everyone's opinions are heard. And um, I would also, I guess, finally, if you're going to be a leader in an organization, I mean, you have to role model that. And... Um, and if you're not going to role model that, I mean, who, who is going to role model, role model that? So. Sounds great. You know, I, I sit at a little desk once in a while, and I, on the computer the other day, I read about, about April 26, 2019, Walmart is going to discontinue the disability employment program that they have, their greeter program. 
And I'm not going to compare Walmart and, and, and General Mills because I know there's no comparison. But what I want to find out is what does General Motors do for disability employment? And secondly, I'd like to find out what kind of volunteer programs you have, such as, let's say, the Salvation Army for your employees there, General Mills, community programs. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to be, if you're going to be in, so the, the, the question really is about, I, the, the beginning of it I didn't quite hear, but it was about the Disabilities Act and Walmart and something that was going on there. And, and then you kind of transition into, you know, how does General Mills think about disability and inclusion that way in the workforce? The, the first thing I would say is, look, if you want an inclusive environment, you can't like be selectively inclusive. I mean, you know, inclusive means inclusive. And so, and so whether you come from a military background or LGBT or whether you have a dis disability, whether it's a, a physical disability or a learning disability, um, you know, we, we, we work to include all people to give their best in our organization. And we have programs, we have programs internally with internships from high schools where we have disadvantaged kids who come in and learn the value of work. And I'm really proud of what that, I'm really proud of that work. We have some people with some mental disabilities who, who are employed at General Mills doing tasks that really fits what they do. And they get a lot of satisfaction out of it. And there's, there's one lady who comes and delivers the mail every day and she always stops by my office to say hi, always. <laughs> And she is just so excited. She gets to say hi to the CEO. And, and, and I say hi back, and we have a conversation for a while. And so whether it's physical disabilities or mental disabilities or people come from different points of view, if you're going to have an inclusive culture, you kind of have to meet it. You have to meet it all the way. And in one of the ways we promoted that recently is that we've always, General Mills has always prided itself on being a leader in benefits. And, and we got a little behind. And, um, and to, you know, Jacqueline Williams role, who's the head of HR, to her immense credit and her team, we kind of, we kind of flipped the script on that. And one of the things we, we have done is we've increased our parental leave. And uh, not only for women, but also for men. It's a parental leave. It's not a leave for women, it's parental leave. And, um, you know, for time for families to, to bond. And so we've, I mean, I think we've taken a leadership role over that. And that's really important because you want to make sure that whether it's, it's um, men with young children or women with young children that, that they, yeah, we want them to give their best to General Mills, but they're not going to give their best if they're worried about what's going on at home. And so, you know, we've done a lot, we've done a lot in our benefits area to make sure that we're matching the benefits to the times as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm a longtime investor in General Mills stock, so I'm one of those people who watches it. I guess having watched what's happened now with Kraft Heinz and the takeover by, uh, what is it, 3G or whatever, um, are there risks to General Mills right now, and how are you dealing with these uh, private equity firms or if they're eyeing you and how are you reacting to that today? Yeah, so the question about Kraft Heinz, and this is where I got to be careful, but the, the, <laughs> it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good question, and I'm going to answer it as best I can, keeping in mind that I can only answer it as best I can, but the, the question was about Kraft Heinz and what happened with Kraft Heinz, and, and just a little context for those of you in the room who don't watch food stocks every day. I do watch it. I want you to know I watch our stock every day. <laughs> But um, Kraft Heinz had an earning announcement uh, about a week or so ago, and you know, they took down earnings for the year after they had revised it for the third quarter, and and uh, it just the whole thing didn't go very didn't go very well for them. And and then you know the question is how does it relate back to to General Mills? I think you know it's something that I've been talking about, and we talked about in our investor presentation in February, and I've been talking about since I become CEO, and. And it really is about, is about making sure that, yes, we, we make more money, but we have to grow to do it. So it's about sustainable growth. And the problem that they've had is they haven't had sustainable growth because their sales are less than they were four years ago. Their profit is the same and their debt is higher. And uh, you can only do that for so long. And so um, I, I have my, the technical term I've called for this is staying in the middle of the boat. And so now I've had some, actually some analysts starting to repeat back to stay in the middle of the boat. And you can get too far to one side of the boat if you're just cutting costs. You can get far to the other side of the boat in the food business if you say, you know, I'm just going to grow sales. And it doesn't really matter how much money I make. You can do that for a while, but, that, but not very long. And so the key is to, to do a little bit of both. And, and I'm recalling a conversation I had, and he, he does not remember this, but a conversation I had with Steve Sanger when I, when I took over the cereal business in 2007. He was the CEO. And he called me into his office, and you know one of the things he, he said was, 
uh, well, first he said, Big G is a very fast car. Try to keep it out of the ditch. And, um, and I, I wrote that down, and you can tell I still remember. I did keep it out of the ditch. We came close to the wall a couple times, but I didn't manage to keep it out of the ditch. But the other is, he said, you know, Jeff, in, in any one year, it's, it's really easy to make more money. And easy one, in any one year, it's easier to sell more stuff. And the, the trick is to try to do both at the same time. And I've never forgotten that. And that's kind of how I think about what we try to do now and maybe what's different from what some others are trying to do is that, you know, we, we want to be good to our, we have to be good to our shareholders over the long term. And the way you do that is to, is to grow a little bit and to like a, make a little bit more money while you are making the world a better place to live, whether it's through your employees or whether it's through sustainability or how you contribute to communities. And so for me, the, the key for us at General Mills is to try to do that. Our, our cash flow is better than it was a year ago. And it was better last year than it was the year before that. We've maintained our guidance for the entire year, and our cash flow is better than what we said. So we're, we're feeling through th for, for the first couple quarters of the year, we're feeling pretty good about where we've, uh, where we've landed, and we think what we're trying to do is a little bit different than what Kraft Times was trying to do, and, and that's the key, staying in the middle of the boat. We have time for one final question. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Given your leadership yeah. role uh, back in um, Serial Partners with Nestle, can you comment on the importance of that relationship uh, with Nestle given its role as a giant in global food industry? Yeah, so the question about le leadership of, of, uh, of CPW and how that works, we have, we have three former CEOs of that, of that joint venture here, so I'll answer the question. But there are a couple folks up here who can answer that later on. The, um, we've had a great relationship with Nestle going back three decades. We have a joint venture with Nestle to sell cereal outside the United States, about $2 billion in, in sales. It was started in about 1990 and it still exists today. So it's almost 30 years old. So that in and of itself is quite unique. And I think the reason that, the reason that it was set up was because we were competing effectively here with Kellogg's and cereal in the U.S., but we, did, we didn't have a way to do that outside the U.S. because we hadn't become more global at the time. Nestle was competing with Kellogg's outside the U.S., and, and to, by their own admission, they didn't exactly know what they were doing in breakfast cereal, although they had a great infrastructure in which to do it. And so the joint venture was founded. We brought our, our technical capabilities and our marketing capabilities and understanding of cereal. Nestle brought an infrastructure outside the U.S. that General Mills couldn't replicate. And so that was why the joint venture was formed in the first place. And, the, and a lot of times joint ventures are formed because one company has a bad business and the other one has a bad business, and they put it together. All they do is have a bigger bad business that's managed by two companies. That was not the case with CPW. It was managed because we both saw an opportunity to grow. And we both thought we had skills that we could bring to the joint venture. I would say that's largely what was true in 1990 is, is still true today. We bring, we bring the marketing acumen and knowledge of, of cereal. Nestle has an infrastructure in developing markets throughout the world that's difficult for any other company in the world to match, more or less General Mills. And so it, it, it's based on, first of all, we, we both brought something unique. We both had a similar vision how it would work. The joint venture was written, it was on one paper. It was on one sheet of paper. It took about three weeks to complete. It is not complex. And, um, and I think the other thing is that there's a tremendous amount of respect between Nestle and General Mills, and there always has been. And we're a different company with different leaders. And by the way, that doesn't mean we always agree, but it's really important if you're not gonna agree that you have respect for each other. And um, I know that I certainly have had a lot of respect for watching Nestle operate in markets throughout the world. And, and I know for a fact they have a lot of respect for General Mills. And I think, I think you know, in addition to, to needing what the other has, having respect for each other, and again, not being jerks, I think that's a key to the, I think that's a key to the partnership because it would be very easy for, for CEOs or leaders of two of the biggest food companies in the world to think they have a monopoly on the truth, and that would, that would actually get in the way and undermine the, the whole joint venture, and 29 years in, it hasn't. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. I'm going to add staying in the middle of the boat to my row your boat, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, well, that's, that's right, row from the middle language so it's um it's wonderful to have you here and thank you so much for you know for coming and participating in first Tuesday. yeah thank you for the invitation i've enjoyed it thank you